but it's for his glory that I say it. God bless you. Now, in the 13th chapter of Hebrews, I wish to read some scripture because no service is complete without the reading of God's word. My word will fail. Everybody else's word will fail. But God's word will never fail. Hebrews 13, 10 to 14. We have an altar whereof they which have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burnt without the camp. Jesus, therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the king, bearing his reproach. Here's my text. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. I imagine my voice has a little blast in there, and I'll get back. Can you hear all right up in the balcony, up in the second balcony, all right? What I wish to speak on is here we have no continuing city to kind of back up and and you pray with me. There's no one that I think of when Abraham left the city of Ur, Ur, Ur and the land of Chaldean, he was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. Now there was something in Abraham that he could see that great city of Ur, and he knew that that very thing that made people colonize together, there was bound to be a city somewhere that was typed off of. And by instinct, or by the leading of the Holy Spirit, he hunted that city whose builder and maker was God. And he sojourned in the strange land, professed to be pilgrims and strangers, uh, seeking this city, and dwelling in tents with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, then, we see that city. There's no matter how many places you ever roam, no matter how far you go, there's no place like home. Is that right? How many here today is away from home? Let's see your hands. Just away from home. Oh, my. I wish I could sing. I'd sing we're pilgrims and strangers seeking a city to come. Being ever so humble, there's no place like home. Let's take a little trip back home. Would you like to do that? I believe everyone here would like to take a trip home, wouldn't you? Just like to go back home. There's no place that you'll ever go that'll ever seem like that lovely little old city you lived in or little old dwelling place out in the country. For myself, I, I want to walk back down the road just this afternoon with each one of you, taking a little evening stroll to look, view the things over. The first thing comes into my mind at this time is a little humble home built out in the country by the broom sage field and some old apple trees standing around where my father and mother and their little family live. A little humble place indeed uh, we were very, very poor. Daddy had a hard time. He was a very poor man. He worked for 75 cents a day in, in logwoods. My father had a bad habit, drinking. I'm sorry to have to say that, but that's true. And he, he, my father died in my arms. I see my daddy work so hard that when he would come in, his, his back would be sunburned until his shirt would be sticking to his back and mother would have to take and clip the shirt loose from his back. I don't care what he done, he's my daddy. I'm not ashamed of my father. I love my daddy. He's gone on today, but he's still daddy. And young people remember, if you're fortunate enough today to have a daddy and a mother living, love them, honor them. The hour will come, and you're think to the greatest people in the world if you don't now. And don't never, little fellows, don't never give this slantering word, old man and old woman. That's not the old man and old woman. That's daddy and mother. And some of these days when they go out of the room, the casket of flowers, you hear them lower down to the ground, the pastor say ashes to ashes and dust. It won't be the old man then. Or it won't be the old woman. It'll be mother and you'll be wringing your hands and crying. That's right. Now, while she's a living, give her her flowers now and give Dad his flowers. That's right. Now, and the best flower you can give him is obey him. And that's the first promise in the Bible, the first commandment of the promise. Honor thy father and mother, which may lengthen the days upon the earth that the Lord giveth thee. My daddy worked on a farm. I remember 
Mother, the furniture we had in the house was the old hickory bottom chairs. How many remember the old hickory bottom chairs, Rat? Well, I'm not the only country person in here, am I? And we had an old kerosene lamp with a big old uh, hoot owl on the chimney. Remember that old owl? It used to be the one I had to clean it because my hand was so little. I could clean the chimney. And we had a, an old cook stove in the kitchen, and Pop would cut the wood, and we'd bring it in, lay it behind the stove, and us little kiddies would help him saw it up. And we had a, a table, and behind the table was a bench. Daddy took a piece off of a barn and, and made a and made a, a bench that we all, uh, we little boys would go sit on there. We only had three chairs. And so when we get on, and I remember the cabin, the front part of it, it had a, a floor. It had a room in front and a little half room in the back. And we had one of those little, old, we call them monkey stoves or laundry stoves set up on a stump. And Mother cooked from there and she'd holler, dinner's ready. And my, uh, there's about five of we little Branhams, we'd run in there and wash her face and slick that hair down and jump up behind the table in one great big old pot dinner cooked in an old three-legged kittle. How many remember them? Say, I just love to have a dinner out of one right now. And and we'd, she'd take and get beef and make mulligan stew. How many know what mulligan stew is? I'm not the only Irishman here then, am I? So they would put the mulligan stew in there and we had, my plate was a tin plate. Frankly, it was a big bucket lid that was turned over so I'd get a good measure every time the cup went out and dipped out the mulligan stew and we'd bake cornbread in a in a a pan. How many remember old cornbread baked in a pan? Cut it in the middle, put it on, and I sat next to Daddy because every person broke his own bread. And so when he come by, I'd break the corner off because it had more crust on it. <laughs> and so I sure like that yet. Yes, sir, I sure do. I've eaten many good places. And some of the best places, I guess, in the nation that minister friends of mine have taken me to dinner, which I'm very, very thankful but friends, I'd give everything I ever had or ever will have if I could sit behind that old table one more time and look at my daddy sitting there and eat some money and stew with him. I'll never do it no more. That's right. It's done forever. Enjoy your childhood, young people. Love God. See all my brothers sit around there, the little healthy-looking things, some of them's in eternity. I can never do that no more. For here we have no continuum in the city, but we seek him one to come. I used to see my daddy when he would come in. He's a little fellow about my size, but strong built. And he would wind up his sleeves like that. And we had it out the, the old apple tree. They had a wash pan sitting out there with an old piece of a glass. It was drove up in the tree in a towel made out of a meal sack. And we'd go out there and wash this old uh, bench. And and, um, and then we'd clean up on the outside of the little bench around the tree. I'd see daddy when he'd be combing his black wavy hair and the muscles would just wad under his arm. I thought, ooh. My, my daddy had lived to be a thousand years old, I think. I admired my daddy. And I think how strong he is. I said, my, he'll, he'll live and live and live and live because he's so strong. He died at 52. For here we have no continuing city. And I thought, oh, that house, how big. Beneath it was logs. And a big kind of slab board on the outside. I thought, oh, how that house will spend for hundreds of years. Today there's a housing project there. Here we have no continuing city, but we're seeking one to come. That's right. I passed by just before coming here. I just felt a great swelling in my heart. Oh, God. How can this 20 years make such a difference in a place? But here we have no continuing city. We're seeking one to come. And I thought of Daddy and, and all. So we, I remember every Saturday night we'd go to town and, and pay the grocery bill. <clears throat> And every time we'd pay the grocery bill, Mr. Grower would give us, the groceryman, give us a little sack of candy. I think our grocery bill run to the extent of $3 a week. And my, that only made about four and a half. So Mama would get some goods that, get, my wife's sitting here, I'm afraid to say what kind of goods that was, because I make a mistake on it every time. Anyhow, some kind of that little stuff, you know, what they used to make shirts out of. And um, I remember one time at my church, I said, one of the worst I ever was gotten at my church I was going to have a humble night on Wednesday night, and I said, and my choir was all sitting behind me, and I said, and that's uh, G-A-N-G-H-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-G-
sing in a choir. I said, now, Sister Wiseheart, when I back back, if I forget about it, you tell me what that was. And so I didn't understand anything about goods like that. And I said, now, Wednesday night is, is humble night here at the tabernacle. I said, now, all you brothers, wear your work clothes, your overalls. I'm going to preach in my overalls. I said, you all come out with your overalls, and all you women wear your... I said, what well, I backed back, and she said, get him, get him. I said, your greyhound dresses. <laughs> and my oh, my. That was about the worst I ever was gotten. And everybody started laughing at me, and I thought, well, I, I guess I done said it. So I said, every one of that goods is like on this little cat cottage down here. Then one night, I was run home, I was patrolling. I used to carry those great big old... Uh, red handkerchiefs. When you hunt, you know you have to have a red handkerchief. And I carry one in my pocket. And, and uh, one night I run in. We lived in a little two room cabin. And I I run across the street real quick to church. I was late, and I run across the street real quick, you know. And I dressed in the room and changed clothes. And I was over there just a preaching away, you know. And I got to perspiring. I reached back and got this handkerchief, you know. And I started shaking it like this. And I looked at that big old red handkerchief. I see my wife look at me, and I said, oh, well, I said, I'm afraid of them little ones, afraid I'd swallow it. <laughs> and that was about the two of the worst I ever knew, uh, was gotten in, in, in church. But I remember Daddy would take us down on Saturday night and pay the grocery bill and get those, uh, those a little old sack of candy. And we had a little old jersey wagon. You all call them out here buckboards, I believe, or whatever. And they put some straw in the back, and it'd be cold, and we'd wrap up in blankets, and, and go down, and it'd be spitting snow, and they'd pay the grocery bill, and all these little Irish sitting out there waiting, you know, for this candy to come. Then we'd come out, and, and that candy had to be equally broken among everyone. If there's one stick over, it was broken <laughs> so many pieces. To be sure, every little blue eye was watching right at it, to be sure he never got cheated. So we'd sit and eat that, and I'd play a little trick on him. I'd... Uh, we wouldn't eat it, couldn't chew it because it's too valuable. That old stick candy, I'd, we'd suck on it a little while and hold it, you know, wait a little while, rest up and suck on it again. Well, I remember I used to play a trick on them. I'd suck on my piece for a while and wrap it up a piece of paper and put it in my pocket and I'd have some for Monday. I'd suck on it again and tell all boys, don't you wish you had some? And I'd just put that piece in the dirt and candy for the road. And, and they was good. Now, I guess I could go tomorrow and buy a whole box of of chocolates, Hershey's if I wanted to, but it would never taste like that. That's the real candy. And I remember those old days and how glorious they was and how to go into school when school days come along. We went to school. We didn't have any clothes to wear, hardly did. just enough to, that we possibly legally could go. I remember going to school all winter long with one of Mom's shoes on and one of Pop's. That's right. I had, we called it a boot and gagger. And I had one of mom's shoes on this foot and popped. And this is awful to say, but it's the truth. It's the truth. I remember I didn't have any shirt to wear that winter. And Ms. Wath and a rich lady lives up the road from it, gave me a little coat that had a little eagle emblem on it. And I'd pull that coat up like this and go on to school. I remember sitting up there. It got kind of warm, you know, and the teacher said, William? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, aren't you warm? Better take off that coat. I couldn't take that coat off. I didn't have any shirt on. So I said, well, I, I, no, no, ma'am. I said, I'm just a little bit chilly. <laughs> they had a great big old stove sitting on there. She said, you ain't taking a cold. You go over and set that stove. <laughs> Mama. I sat there in a perspiration running down my face. She said, aren't you warm yet? I said, no, ma'am. <laughs> I was plenty warm, but I couldn't take that coat off. I didn't have any shirt on. And so I remember that spring when I... Got my first shirt. I had a cousin, a girl, Lucille Hare, my father's sister's child. They come over to visit, and when she left, she left one of her dresses, and and, and I, I cut the skirt part off, <laughs> and wore the top part of the shirt. I went to school and had this year little. What is that stuff that runs up and down? You know, like I had to put around the edges of garments, rickly rackly or whatever it is. I miss that. Rick, what? Rip rat, and, and so we, we all over it, everywhere, rip rat all over it. So that, down the hill we'd go, ribbity, 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 ribbity. Well, we wasn't sliding like the rest of the boys, but we were sliding anyhow. We, we were getting there anyhow in this old dish pan. Well, that was all right. The rest, some of the boys had slaves, you see. So, after a while, the bottom come out of it. <laughs> so we had no more slave. We went out the river, and I got me a big old log, put a wire on it, and pulled it up top of the hill. And we'd get on this log and ride, 
ride down the hill. I never will forget an event taking place there. There's a boy named Lloyd Ford. Brother Graham, everywhere you're at, my associate pastor is here somewhere. Um, Lloyd Ford, he got him a job. That was the time of the World's War. So he got him a job selling Pathfinders or something like that, magazines. And he got to wear one of them Boy Scout suits. And everything was a war, and then, you know, an army. And, oh, how I wanted to dress like a soldier. I'd see those soldiers come up from the quartermaster and go up the road uh, just at attention, walking. And at the school, we had an old sash brass pole there and raised the flag. And those soldiers come by with it, salute the flag. I thought, how, oh, my heart just beat. When I get big enough, I'm going to join the army. I get plenty of clothes to wear now. If I can join the army. But when I got big enough, I was too scrawny yet to get in the army. And they wouldn't even take me. But somebody accepted me. That's right. I'm in the army today. You might not be able to see my uniform, but I know it's on anyhow. It's on the inside. I'm in the army of the Lord. And so in the war, I tried to volunteer and everything, but they wouldn't, didn't receive me. So they never even called me. They put me in a minister's class and just never even called me. I guess my education was too poor to be in class as a chaplain. And then being a minister, they wouldn't, uh, they didn't draft me. So there I was. I was left out, but... Somehow or another, in my scrawny, uneducated, and all, God sent out a recruit one day, and I answered it, and I, I'm in his army now, and I'm doing the best that I can to fight the greatest battle that's ever fought, a wage against sin and evil, and for righteousness. And I remember, I asked Lloyd, I said, Lloyd, will you give me that suit when you wear it out? He said, yes, I'll give it to you. And that was the longest lasting suit i ever seen. He wore that suit, looked like, well, I've seen him, one time he came up missing it, and I said, Lloyd, what about that suit? He said, I'll see if I can find it, Billy. Looked all around. He said, no, sir. You know, Mother packs Dad's clothes with it, and the dogs use it for a pallet, and they've drug it away. And said, the only thing i got left is one leg. And I said, bring me that. So his little old stave leg and about like that, laced up on the side. So I took that leg, and, you know, and I wore it around home, put it on. My, ah, look how good that looked. You know, one leg. And I thought, my, that felt good. I wanted to wear it to school, but I didn't know just how I was going to get to wear that leg in the school. So I put it in inside of my coat, and I was riding on that log one day, and I went down the hill, and oh, I got up, and I said, my, I hurt my leg. I said, my stockings, you know, and great big holes in them. And I said, I, I just hurt my leg so bad. I said, that just reminds me, I, I, I've got one of my Boy Scout legs here in my coat. I put that leg in on. I walked into school, you know, kind of limping like, but didn't everybody look at that one leg? And, and so I, I had to go up to work the problems on the blackboard. And so that they wouldn't notice, I just had on one leg. And I stood sideways and put this leg in on that side and stood like this and worked the problems like this. Look, I see everybody was looking at me. That one leg in on. Everybody got laughing at me. I got to crying, so she made me come down. <laughs> but, oh my, something that I got a pair of leggings today that I'm not ashamed of. That's right. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And then, many great things happened in childhood back there that wouldn't have time to approach. One thing, not long ago, I was having a revival in Texas. I come home and uh, wife and I and the baby... We went up the road, and I just, so tired, I, I just felt like I'd drop. I just couldn't stand it. And on the road home, I was driving, and, and i go to sleep, and I'd drive about a, a couple of miles, and I'd stop. I'd try to sleep, and I'd wake up, and I'd, I'd drive a little farther, and I'd get sleepy, and just almost go off the road, and I'd, I'd stop. I thought, this is awful dangerous, but I must get home. And I would lay, on, lay down in my car and try to sleep. I woke up after a while, and you know what had happened? I'd... Driving, I'd run off the road and was way out in a cow pasture holding my hand out and saying, Sister, believe it. That's all you have to do. You're going to heal me and believe it. Way out there in the pasture. Or run off the road and out through a the field there and uh, asleep. And wife and I, there's a great crowd of people waiting there, so we got in the car and went up the road. I passed by the old schoolhouse. It's gone, too, where we have no continuing city. And right across from there, there used to be Mr. Watson's chauffeur. And named Combs, they live there. There's a pump that I wanted to drink out of. And I thought, just like David one time, I wanted to drink out of that well. And I went down there to the, and began to pump the water. And the wife and baby, them was picking violets. I was leaning across the old fence and looked at the old hill there where the school used to be and the old trees, the sugar maples where we used to tap them and suck the sap on them in the spring of the year, knowing when it was coming up. And I thought, oh, I could just imagine seeing all those little boys 
standing, lined up there with their hands on one another's shoulders, tramping like this, and the flag up, and we were going in, the teacher with a great big long willow, make this line up just right, and I look up on the hill and see the old home where it used to be in a housing project up there, down here the old school was gone, my, my heart began to swell, I thought, here we have no continuing city, but we're seeking one to come. I remember the boys, that he, I said, let me think, Ralph Fields, where's he at? He's gone. Where's Howard Higdon? He's dead. Where's my brother? Gone. Here we have no... Con- where's Dad? Gone. Where's Charles? Gone. Where's Edward? Gone. I thought, oh God, and soon somebody looked at this ground and said, where's Bill? Gone. Here we have no continuing city. I began to think of it. My heart began to pound. I remember a little dirty trick that I'd done my brother there. Don't do anything wrong that you'll ever regret. I remember one day that Mama gave us some popcorn to take this to school with us. We couldn't eat with the rest of the kids. We'd always run over the hill there and eat because we, the rest of the children could afford sandwiches. And we used to have a little jar. In there would be greens and a piece of cornbread laying on the side and two spoons and maybe a little jar full of stuff. You know, and we'd sit and both of us eat out of this jar with this spoon, eat our bread and pass it back and forth to one another. It was a shame before the children. And we'd run over the hill and eat behind the trees over there. I remember Mama getting us some popcorn around Christmas. We had a sack of it. We took it to school, left it in the cloakroom. And here's a little dirty trick that I did. I held up my hand. The teacher said, why won't William? I said, may I be excused? I said, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. And I went out the building. and went out through the cloakroom. I put my hand down that sack and got a great big handful of that popcorn. Went out and stood behind the school to eat this popcorn to be sure that I got my share of it. And I was eating that popcorn. I never will forget. When dinner time come, we went out and got our bucket and got our popcorn. My brother looked in that sack, about half of it going. He said, say. I said, something happened there, didn't it? I said, sure did. And then, I know what had happened. I had eat his popcorn. So, but he shared the rest of it. And standing there leaning over that fence, I thought of all those things. He's the one that's gone on. He died in the hospital calling for me when I was in Arizona many, many years ago. Friend, if I'd have had a hundred million dollars laying before me, I'd have given everything that I had if I could have tucked him that handful of popcorn back again. Couldn't do it. Gone on. I thought how hard he had to live. He died when he was just a boy. And how the, we tried to share clothes with one another just before he died. He put his hand over his heart and said, I'll never live to see Bill again. But said, Tell him he's my favorite brother. And when I'm there, I was thinking about that then. I started crying. My wife said, I want you to come home to rest. And she seen what was going on. So she got me away and we went on up the road. Life went on as a child, boyhood, out of hurry. When I was a young man, I, I seen the way women lived. I never did like girls. Never did like women. Because I, I got enough to see the way they was lived. If anything, I respected a woman as being true. I don't care if she's any colored white or whatever she is. If she's a real lady, she deserves the highest of respects. God knows that. And I purposed in my heart when I was a little boy that I'd never have nothing to do with women. And I'd be a hunter all my life, and that's what I did. And I'd live in the woods, hunt all night. And that's why, that's where I learned God was by nature. I remember when, of course, when I got to be about 17 or 18 then, as all boys, they, some boy friend of mine, his daddy had a car, James Poole, and he had a little girl he wanted me to meet. And you know how you are. I seen that little girl and I thought she was the prettiest little thing I ever seen. You know, teeth like pearls, eyes like a dove, neck like a swan. Oh my, this is the prettiest thing you ever seen. So I said, she wants to meet you, Bill. And I said, oh. I said, I don't know how to talk to her. I said, I, I can't do that. And he said, oh, come on. So I talked to her a few times and after a while, he said, I'll get Dad's old car. and said, well, we, we'll take our girlfriends a ride. Oh, well, that wouldn't be bad. So, so we went out. We stopped down there to get some sandwiches. And I went in and got some Cokes and some sandwiches and come back out. And we eat the sandwiches. And I took the Cokes back, the Coke bottles back. When I went back, I come out. To my surprise, my little girlfriend was smoking a cigarette. 
Well, I always had my opinion of a cigarette smoking woman, and I haven't changed it yet. It's the most lowest, immoralest, degrading thing that a woman can do. Uh, I'm not here to preach the gospel in that manner. Your preacher will do that. But women, if you do smoke, for mercy's sake, get away from it. How cheap it looks in a woman that'll smoke a cigarette. My, it's the cheapest thing. I'd rather see her drunk anytime. And listen, you talk about a sabotage. Don't you worry about Russia coming in and getting us. Russia ain't going to hurt us. We're hurting ourselves. It's our own moral decay that's a hurting us. We're, we're corrupting ourselves. Statistics shows, but doctors, I believe, that 80% of the women that have children that smoke cigarettes, if they raise their baby like they should, to the breast, in 18 months it dies. It kills the baby, the nicotine poison in the milk of the mother. Why sabotage his columnist? I still say what this world needs today is not a new president. It needs an old-fashioned St. Paul's revival and the Bible Holy Ghost back in the church again. I believe that's right. Yes, sir. That's exactly what it needs. And, and the, the, and the women, how they would smoke, and, and I thought that was terrible to see a woman smoke. Well, that just broke my heart. I just couldn't stand that. And I didn't want nothing to, to do with that. So I just, just left her. And so that was the time when the angel of the Lord appeared to me when she laughed at me, called me a sissy, and made me walk home. That's right. When place she said, well, you big sissy, I wouldn't even ride with you. I said, you don't have to. She said, you don't smoke? And I said, no, ma'am. said, you don't drink either? And I said, no, ma'am. So said, what do you like to do? I said, go fishing, hunting. Of course, that didn't interest her. So I, I was, that was, well, I, I thought about it anyhow, and I'm glad today that I did think that. That's right. Amen. Listen, friends, it ain't the robin that pecks the apple that hurts it. It's the worm at the core that kills the apple. That's what, it's sin in our midst is what's hurting us. That's right. Sin in our midst is the killing us. Now, then I guess you wonder how I ever got married. Well, when I met my wife, she was a Christian girl, very lovely Christian girl. And I was then about 23, 24 years old. She's a very sweet, humble character. And I met her, I'd take her to church, and she went to church, and she was a very fine, lovely woman. All these people here, my friends from Jeffersonville sitting here in front of me, knows her, knew her, and how a lovely woman she was. She's in her grave today. But that's her body, her souls with Christ. And she was a very lovely Christian character. And I went with her a while, and she come from a good home. Her father, during the time of the Depression, and that was, he made about $600 a month. He was a brotherhood organizer on the Pennsylvania Railroad. I made 20 cents an hour digging ditches. And so I couldn't marry the girl, I didn't think. And I thought, well, if I went with her any longer, I was taking up her time. She's too good a girl to let go. She'd make some man a good wife. So I had to either just let her go or ask her to marry me, and I didn't have nerve enough to do that. So I guess you wonder how I got. I wrote her a letter and asked her if she'd marry me. And I said, well, I, now it, it wasn't dear miss, will you have me? It was a little bit what you call mushier than that. And I, I, I kind of talked to her, but here, I remember, I thought, I've got to do something because it's not right to take the girl's time. So I wrote her a letter, and I went to work that morning, and I was working public service company, and I was very nervous about dropping it in the box. It was on Monday morning. I dropped it in the box, and all day I thought about it. I thought, tonight, uh-oh, I'll hear from that tonight. Her mother will call me up and break me over the cold. And I went on. That night, it was all right. I was to meet her Wednesday to take her over to the church. So I remember then come on towards Wednesday, and Wednesday night I was just and nervous. I didn't know what to do. I'll, what am I going to do when I get up there? So I asked my mother, has, has Hope called? No. You get any mail? No. Well, maybe it hung up and didn't even get out of the box. So I thought, something's happening here. So I went up and I, I blowed the horn outside. And um, so she come out. She said, come in. I thought, uh-oh. You're going to get me in there where her mother is now. <laughs> and then I'm really going to get it. So I said, <clears throat> are you about ready? She said, let's walk to church. I thought, oh, my. So... I said, all right. And I went in, and Miss Brownback looked at me and said, hello, Bill. And I said, how do you do? So, I was as nervous as I could be. So I thought something was going to happen any time. You know how you feel when you're on the stream. So we went on out, went to church. Honest, I didn't even hear what Brother David said that night. He just preached away, and I, I didn't know what he said. I was scared something was going to happen. And I looked at her, and I thought, oh, my, isn't she pretty? 
I, she's going to tell me this is all I'm sure in the world. Because I can just tell it. I said, I know she's going to tell me. Uh, stay home, Master. <laughs> so I had it all fixed up what she's going to tell me. And, I, and after church was over, we started walking back a pretty moonlight night. We was walking down the street. And I looked up to see the moon shining down through the bushes. Went on and on. I looked at her and I thought, my, I hate for this to be the last night. But I guess this is it. And I walked on and on. I said, how are you tonight? <laughs> She said, just fine. How are you? <laughs> I thought, hurry up, lady. Tell me something <laughs> before I faint. <laughs> Don't get too close to home. We walked on a little farther, and I said, <clears throat> sure pretty nice. She said, yes, it is. <laughs> I thought, well, wait, hurry up. Say something. You know, women can just keep you like that anyhow, you know, under that suspense. And I walked on. I thought, well, to get pretty close to home, I said, um, uh, did the... Uh, did you get any mail this week? She said, uh-huh. That was all. And I said, uh, did you get my letter? She said, uh-huh. <laughs> my, my. I was certainly burning energy then. And I said, well, um, well, I said, D- did you read it? She said, uh-huh. <laughs> I said, what'd you think of it? She said, it's all right. <laughs> and uh, I said, did, did, you, did, you, did you read all of it? She said, yes, I read it all. <laughs> I said, what'd you think of it? She said, it was all right. <laughs> well, we got married. <laughs> I don't know how. We just got married. So, my... The next strain come when I had to ask her mother and daddy. Well, I know it was appropriate to do that. So I never will forget Charlie Brum. He may be sitting right here this afternoon for all I know. And her mother was a very princely sort of a woman, fine woman, but she belonged up in the ranks, you know, and so but Charlie was just a good old humble brother. I I thought I better ask him and let him ask her. You see. So I thought I'd get by the man better than I could talk to the women anyhow. So I said, uh, one night I was leaving, Hope said, have you asked Dad yet? And I said, no. She said, well, you, you ought to. I said, I know I should, but I'm going to said, I think it'll be all right. So when I went to leave that night, he said, uh, see you later, Billy. I said, <coughs> Charlie? He said, I said, uh, could, could I talk to you just a little bit? <laughs> you said, I said, come out here just a minute. Walk out a portion. I just was sweating and shaking. <laughs> He said, uh, I said, Charlie, I said, I-, I want to ask you something. He said, oh, you can have her, Bill. Go on and speak to her. <laughs> oh, my, I love him to this day. I said, uh, Charlie, I can't make her a living like you do. I can't give her clothes like you can buy her. But I promise you this. I love her with all my heart. I'll work till my hands bleed to make her a living. And I'll be as true to her as I know how to be. He put in he was a German. He put his big hand over on me and said, Bill, I'd rather you would have her and be good to her than somebody that had a lot of money would treat her mean. I said, thank you, Charlie. We got married. We didn't have nothing to start housekeeping on. The only thing we had, i tell you what we had, a little old place where I rented. My rent cost me $4 a month. And I went into a little old place there, and somebody gave us an old-fashioned folding bed. You remember that old folding bed? Straw mattress, straw tick on it. And then, and uh, we had a little old table we bought from Sears and Roebuck and chairs. We had to, to paint it ourselves. And, uh, and so I painted it. And we had two linoleum rugs. Got from John Jobbers. <laughs> that was just a second-hand place. down in the and I said that John Jobbers so they could catch the benefit of it. And so we got, I think they cost a dollar and a quarter a piece. And I went over to Mr. Weber's, and he's a junk dealer, and bought a cooking stove. And I give him a dollar and something for it, and I had to pay a dollar and seventy-five cents for grapes to put in. I got an ice box from the public service company for fifty cents when they took it on swap. We went to housekeeping, but friends, it was just this paradise on earth. We had each other. I become converted in that time, become a minister, and was preaching. And I loved the Lord with all my heart, and we loved one another, and that's all we cared for. And listen, happiness does not consist of how much the world's good you own. But how contented you are with the potions lotted to you. That's right. Remember that. That's all we had. We were happy and lovely. I had a little church there they built for me. The little tabernacle stands today yet. It's memorial. 
And we all, great crowds of people come from far and near around the country to hear the simple gospel. And we were just doing wonderful. And I remember a lovely little boy was born into our home. I call him Billy Paul. I want him to be with me in the next meeting to Carl's bed as soon as we leave Arkansas here. And so he's 14 years old now. And a little later on, 11 months come along, another, another lovely little sweet thing by the name of Sharon Rose. Just before Billy was born, we had saved enough money to I was wanting to take a little time off. And we, I went up to Walljack, Michigan to a, a meeting and a, with an old man that had white beard and white hair by the name of John Ryan. And uh, so I went up there, and on the road back, coming back, I'd seen sign, great crowds of people everywhere when I passed through Mishawaka. I thought, what are those people? And I went over there, and there's some of them in T-model Fords and some in Cadillacs. And they told me that they were, I couldn't get nothing to, no place to stay. And they said, you're, you're, there's a conference going on here. The Pentecostal people are having a conference. The, the PA of JC, I believe it was PA of JC. Uh, denomination of Pentecost call it. Well, I've seen all kinds of people. I thought, well, that's a religious meeting. Believe I'll go in. Well, I never heard so much noise in all my life. So all church manners, they didn't have it. They were screaming, shouting, and carrying on. I thought, what in the world? I looked around there, and it's at a tabernacle. Some of you might know the man's name. His name's Rao, or Reverend Rao. Anybody here happen to know Reverend Rao? And, um, yes, someone here knows him. Uh, Reverend Rao. It was in his church. Well, they were just clapping their hands and carrying on and dancing. And I, well, I said, my, isn't that horrible? People dancing in the church? I said, well, that's a shame. And I was sitting in the seat of the scarf, well, sure enough. So I thought something old kind of got a hold of me a little bit. And I thought, well, now, I counted my money. I had I had $2.15 left. And I went out and got, I thought, well, now, I can't stay in a tourist court because they ain't got the money. But I'm going to stay over just got enough money to buy my gasoline to get home. So... I went out that night and slept in a cornfield. And I know uh, I didn't have very good clothes. And the next morning, when I went to the service. And that day, all my ministers preached. And, and how I noticed that night, they called said, every preacher comes to the platform. 150 more preachers come up the platform. It's having a conference, international conference. And they were all sitting on the platform. He said, we haven't got time for all of you to testify. I went up. He said, just say who you are and where you're from. And he came to me. I said, advances. We ran him to Jeffersonville. Sat down. Well, come to find out, I was the youngest minister in the group at then. So then that night I thought, they had a, they was bringing all kinds of preachers, and it shows an old colored man to bring the message for that night. Real old, just a little rim of hair around his head. He had an old preacher's coat on, that velvet collar, kind of that cutaway coat. Poor old fellow come out to the platform like this. Oh, I felt so sorry I wanted to get up and help the old man. And he'd come out. And they had to have the conference up there on account of not having it in the South because they had both colored and white to, together. And the old fellow was standing there, you know, and all the ministers that day had been preaching on what Jesus done and so forth. But he ever took his, he took his text over in Job somewhere there where he said, Where were you and I laid the foundations of the world and when morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Well, where the ministers is bringing the activities of the church on earth, he went up into the heavens back under and come from back down about 10 million years before the world was ever formed and come back down the horizontal rainbow with him. And about the time he got down there, he let out a great big hoop and jumped up and clicked his heel together. said, Glory to God. He ain't got room enough up here for me to preach. I looked at that. I said, Well, if that'll make an old man like that act like that, what would it do to me if I got some of it? I said, I want some of that. That's what I want. If it'll make an old man like that, well, what would it do for me? So I went out that night in the cornfield and I began to pray. I said, Lord, let me get some of that. <laughs> so I, I said, You give me favor with them people. And prayed away in the night out there in a the cornfield. I took my, had some sear sucker trousers. My others was, got all dirty there in the cornfield. So I, I laid them on my seat and took the two seats and put them together out of my car and pressed my trousers that night. And I had my little sear sucker shirt. Nobody knew me, so I just laid it down there. Sear sucker shirt and a little old t-shirt and sear sucker trousers, rather. I laid them down there. Next morning I got up, shined them all up. Me and get at 10 o'clock. We had breakfast after breakfast. And I wouldn't go eat with them because I didn't have no money to put in. I just didn't, didn't eat with them. But they made me welcome. Everything I didn't know no one there. But a little fellow, I forget what his name was, he played a violin, a little curly headed fellow. And so the next morning I walked in, sat down, and so after a while I looked over and another man came in and sat down, a colored man sat down by me, big bunch of people sitting there. So I was sitting there and just they said, We're going to begin the services and they was talking, making their uh, selling literature and whatever they had. And he said, 
uh, there was a minister on the platform last night by the name of Branham from Jeffersonville. Said uh, he was the youngest man on the platform. We want him to come up and bring the morning message. Mercy. Well, I've never even seen a microphone. They had a microphone there. I thought, what? Well, I couldn't sear sucker trousers and t-shirt. I just hunkered down real low like this. He announced again, said, anybody know where William Branham of Jeffersonville said, we want him to come up and bring the message. 1,500 people and sitting there. Not me before that. I just sat back there. No, sir. This, I was too country fine to get up there. So I just sat there real low. And so, um, and he announced it two or three times. said, anybody on the outside, uh, we're paging for William Branham. I thought, and something told me, he said, that's what you prayed for last night. If you want to get acquainted with them people, get up there. Said, Lord, I can't do that. <laughs> Here's sucker trousers and t-shirt. I said, no, uh-uh. So I was sitting there, and uh, he, when he announced again, this colored man looked over me and said, do, 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 do you know that man? <laughs> oh, my. Talk about on the spot. I said, I had, I know I had to lie or, or, or something or be telling. I said, look, fella, look, I keep this to yourself. I said, I'm he, see? But he said, well, get up there, white man, get up there. I said, no. I said, I got on, look at these pants here. He said, them people don't care what you got on. They want to hear you. And I said, look, I can't get up there. I said, I don't, you just keep still. And he said, if anybody knows where, he said, here he is, here he is. <laughs> here he is. I thought, oh, my. I just feel my heart, boy, my knees real weak and my arms look like it's going to drop off. Well, this looked like something picked me up, and here I went walking up, just as conscious, sears, sucker, trousers, and t-shirt. I got up there, and I said, folks, I don't know very much about before them preachers who could really preach. Oh, my. I said, I just want to say that I, I love Jesus, and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, started like that. And, and uh, so he said, uh, I started to walk off, and he said, well, speak a little for us, uh, Brother Branham. <laughs> I turned over, and I said, I, I, I just don't know what to say. And I have to think of a text. And then he cried, the rich man, that uh, when he lifted up his eyes in hell. And I took that text, and then he cried. And I got to speak it, and the first thing you know, something hit me. <laughs> My, <laughs> I was lost out of this world for a while. And everybody got to screaming. I went outside when the service was over, and a great big fellow from Texas with, a, with cowboy boots on and a big cowboy hat said, I'm a preacher. I thought, well, brother... <laughs> Monster sucker trousers not so bad after all. <laughs> you know, cowboy boots and a big cowboy hat to be a preacher. And he said, I heard you say you was an evangelist. I'd like to sign you up for a couple weeks revival down in Texas. I took his name. I said, oh, my Lord, you're just doing great things for me. I took that all down, you know, a little bitty fellow with these little golf playing trousers on. Walked up said, I'm from Florida. Like, have you over there for a couple weeks? My, I've seen it just common people after all. So... First thing, a, Indian, a woman come up to the Indian reservation, wanted me to go there. Well, I had enough invitations last me about a year. Ma I jumped in that old Ford, it had backslidden, down the road I went. I rushed in alone, wife met me, you know, and I said, oh, honey, I got something to tell you. I met the cream of the crop. <laughs> I said, my people who just scream and shout and jump up and down, they're not ashamed of their religion. I said, my, the best you ever seen. She said, where are they at? I told her, and I said, look here, I got a whole stream here. I said, my, I can just preach and preach and preach it. And you know what? They accepted me. I said, is that right? I said, look, I'm going to quit my job and start right out. She said, well, we haven't got any money. I said, how much money we got? I said, we got that $12 in there, payment on the Ford. I said, well, you know what the Bible said? Don't, don't take anything when you go. See? Don't take any script, or if you got two coats, give one to your brother. He said, I I'll be with you. I said, that's what he said. I said, when you go with me, she, bless her heart. She said, yes, I'll stick with you. So I, I went and told my mama, and mama said, oh, it's all right, honey, if you feel that. Well, I went and had to tell her mother, and that didn't work so good. <laughs> she said, William, she said, she's your wife. You may take her if you want to. But said, I don't want my daughter drug out among that bunch of trash. Mm. Trash? Friends, I found out this, that what she thought was trash is the cream of the crop. That's right. And I say that with respect. said, uh, uh, out like that, we're all that carrying, screaming and carrying on like that. said, won't you go on up there and be a pastor, and, and someday they'll build you a parsonage? And, well, that, <laughs> that didn't, oh my. So Hope began to cry, and so I said, well, she said, I'll go with you, but anyhow, I didn't want, she said, her, 
how it would have hurt her, so I just let it go. Went on. Friend, the little girl that was too good to be with that trash, I buried her just a little after that. Sorrow set in right there. And I'll hurry just a few minutes. I got left about 15 minutes. There's where sorrow struck me. Now you let my, what my mistakes be your gain. You, you prosper, but what I had to suffer for. Sometimes you see me standing on the platform laughing. That's, you don't know what's beneath there. That's right. I tell you, it has been a price paid that nobody knows but God alone. Right away, my wife taken sick. First thing, I lost my daddy. I ran over to the house to see him, picked him up in my arms like that. He looked up at me like that. He smiled. A doctor gave him a dose of medicine and killed him. One dollar dose of strychnine for his heart, and he killed him. Of course, there's nothing said about that. An undertaker covers up the doctor's mistakes. Now, nothing that I've got against doctors, but I say there's nothing said about that. But some woman here not long ago trusted God out in California for her baby, and it died. And every newspaper and magazine packed it across the country. And at the same time, where one didn't have faith enough for deliverance, everybody criticized that, all the magazines and papers. And God heals thousands, and they, you have to pay them to put it in the paper or something like that. But look here. Let me tell you something. The Bible said, come let us reason together. Is that right? Listen, the same time that picture was being packed across the country telling people that divine healing can't be trusted and everything like that, the doctor lost thousands times thousands of cases. And there was nothing said about that. Isn't that right? Listen, come read together. Sauce for the goose is for the gander too. That, and let me tell you, if one person being lost by divine healing with not enough faith to recover and it's all branded as fanaticism, then if the doctor loses one case, branded fanaticism. Sauce for the goose is for the gander. Is that right? That's right. But friends, what medical science and ministers ought to get together and cooperate together and know we're all working for the good of the people and for the glory of God and work together. That's what we ought to do. But anyhow, my father, he was killed then with his doctor, giving an overdose of medicine and it killed him. And right away, my brother was riding on the side of a car, got his neck broke, died in my other brother's arms. My sister-in-law died. My wife took sick and was... Oh, the 1937 flood uh, came up. And there was sorrow. I never will forget it. Wife was laying just at the point of death. I went and I was praying for her, doing everything I knew. And every time I'd pray, it looked like... And I went and told my church, I said, she's going to die. I said, no. That's just, I said, she's going to die as certain as anything. My babies, both of them were sick. The flood come up and everything. Houses breaking over and rushing and miles of water sweeping over the country. And they taken my wife out to the hospital to the government hospital, temporary hospital, and I was on patrol duty, and I was riding up and down the streets and trying to get the people out. And I never will forget one horrible night. Oh, God, when I think of it, there, in that critical hour, I had a, a, a truck there, a little patrol truck, and I was taking a boat, and I was coming up the, the road, and somebody said over on Chester Street, the dike's about ready to break through, and said there's a woman screaming for mercy where there nobody can get to her. Well, I was raised on the river and thought that I was, could do pretty good with the boat. And so I got the boat and set it in the water and started off. And I looked over there and I heard that mother about 11 o'clock at night just screaming, Mercy, help me, help me, standing out on a force. And I got up there and tried to get the boat across and went way down, come out the other side, the water sweeping down through the street. I went way back again and tried and finally hit against the post. And the mother fainted. I picked her up, put her in a boat. Four or five little children. I got them in and went back and finally got to the shore. And just as I got to the shore, somebody said, My baby, my baby. Well, I thought the woman left a little baby in there. And back I went. And just as I got over there, I run through the house, come to find out. Her, the baby, this little girl in there, about two or three years old, and that's who she was talking about. And I didn't know it. And I was over there, and the dike broke through up there on Chestnut Street, poured down, and away went the building. And just as I jumped in my boat and had to run my hand in the water to jerk the, the rope, or my boat, then I got out into the stream and couldn't get it started. On down we floated. Got out over on, on Market Street there. Big waves of dashing against the side. I thought any minute I would go to the bottom. I knew there in that boat, I knelt down. I said, oh God, I know I have disobeyed you. And I believe, friends, if I went on back under when those people called me in, the gift of healing would have been manifested right there. That was God's program, but I failed to walk in what he told me to do. I listened to what people told me instead of what God told me to do. Don't never do that. You follow what God tells you to do. And then 
sorrows is on. And I prayed. I said, oh, God, I know I've disobeyed you. If you'll just help me, I don't want to die. I don't want to drown out here in this river. Please, God, let this motor start. Will you please not pull that string and the ice freezing and it chug a couple times and that boat ripping and jumping and dashing like that done got out into the main current. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And I tried and tried and it wouldn't start. And I prayed again. I said, God, my poor wife laying out there sick. My baby's sick and hear me drowning in the river. Why, oh, God, what can I do? And I said, you just help me, Lord. And I pulled a string again and away it went. Oh, my. I started right into the river. Out of the river, got on into the, come out way down towards Clarksville. And I come around and got back up and got to my truck. And some of them said, did you know the government just washed out? When that dike broke, out to the hospital I went as hard as I could. I met a brother George D. Art there. He said, oh, Brother Bill, he put his arms around me. He said, looks like things are close. He said, Brother Bill, if I never meet you again, I'll meet you in the morning. That's the last time I see him in life. That's right. He left a little afterward. And I said, where's Hope? said, I don't know. And I went over there and I met a, one of the officers at the government. I said, sir, what become of the hospital? He said, all washed through there. And I said, did, all, did all of them, any of them get drowned? He said, no. They went out on a train to Charleston. And I run and got my car and started out the Highway 62 leading to a little city, Charleston. And when I got out there, there was about five miles of water. Done come down through Lancaster Sand Creek and cut it off. I went and got my boat, and I couldn't even pierce that water. I'd start through there and whirl around like this. And I, I'd set the, at, at this angle and just give it all the gas that I could and hit them waves like that. It was so rough. It'd come around the side of them woods and throw my boat back down this way, and I'd come out down behind the government. And there I was caught on a little island like, and I'd sit there for days up on that island. Thinking, some of them said the trussles went out from under the bridge up there and everybody that went out on that train was drowned. Wife, two children, and all. Oh, God, how nervous I got. I, I walked the floors. I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh, what will I do? And they're gone. And after a while, as soon as I could get over it, the water dropped enough that they could get me across, I got to Charleston. I was looking. I met old, an old friend of mine. He said, no, that train never washed off. Said They went through, but I don't know where they're at. I went out and the dispatcher told me, he said, a mother and two sick children, I put them off in Columbus, Indiana, but you can't get to them. He said, the water's cut off this side. I started walking back down the road, rubbing my hands, crying. He said, oh, God, take me. Don't let me suffer. Let, take me, Lord. Don't let me have to go through this agony. Walking down the road, and a man drove up to me in a car. He said, I know what you're looking for. I said, you're looking for your wife, aren't you? I said, yes. He said, don't you know me? He said, I, I go with Mary Mayo. I said, yes, I remember you. He said, your wife is dying in the Baptist church at Columbus, Indiana. And I said, surely not. I said, yes. I said, she's got tuberculosis. And said, you wouldn't even know her. And the doctor says she's going to die. She's laying right next to my girlfriend. He said, I know how to get you there if you want to go. And I said, well, let's go, brother. And I remember that night when I run into the building up there, the Baptist, they made a hospital. They had army cops everywhere. And I run in there, boots on where we wait in the water, and I begin to scream, Hope, Hope, where are you, honey? Where are you? Just um, beside myself. Directly, I looked over there and I seen an old bony hand raised up. It was her. I run over real quick to her and grabbed her up my arms. I said, is the children alive? She said, yes. She said, I look awful, don't I? I said, no, honey, you look good. I said, my, you're going to be all right. I felt somebody tap me on the back. And it looked, it looked like a doctor. He said, come here. He said, are you her husband? I said, yes. Are you Reverend Branham? I said, I am. He said, well, sir, I hate to break this news to you. He said, your wife's dying. I said, don't get her excited or anything. I said, Dr. Shirley, I said, yes, said, she's going. And I said, oh, what is it? The doctor said, galloping tuberculosis. He said, she'll just die right away. He said, just, just, make, just make her feel good as you can. He said, and both of your babies are sick. I'm tending to them over here in another home. Well, I went back and told her. I said, honey, you look good. And a little doctor friend of mine, Dr. Sam Adair, there in Jeffersonville, as soon as he let me, I brought him back down home. And there, they lay there until the babies got well. The wife gradually went away. Finally, we got her in the hospital. I had doctors to come look at her. There wasn't nothing to be done. She took nematoric treatments and everything. Nothing could be done. Now, I remember standing there and they bore holes down through her side and put that uh, tube in there and get clapped one lung. Listen, if I had it, she'd hold my hand and cry and the tears roll down her cheeks. She'd look at me, just suffering. Never done her a bit of good. If I had to go over it, never go through with it again. That's right. She's holding my hand. But just to show you, the way of a transgressor is hard. I never will forget. I was trying to work to get the bill paid off and then all of one day I was out, I heard a call come and said, if you, if you want to see your wife alive, come at once. I rushed out to the hospital. i never forget it. I jerked off my hat and threw it in the truck and run up through there real quick. And here come little Dr. Dare walking out. God bless his little heart. He's a, he's a fine man. 
And he'd come walking out. We'd eat together, slept together, fish together, just bosom friends. And he'd come walking out. He'd come walking out through the, uh, whole, uh, the hospital. And I see him look at me, and I see him big tears drop off his cheeks, and he turned sideways. And I run into the room. I said, what's the matter, Doc? I said, she ain't gone. I said, I believe she is. I said, come going with me, Doc. He said, Bill, don't ask me to do that. I said, Hope's like my sister. I said, I, I, I can't go in there. Don't, don't, don't ask me to. And the nurse came up and said, come, Brother Bram. I said, here, drink this little bit of medicine. I said, no, I don't need it. He said, go ahead, Billy. That'll rest your nerves. I said, I don't want it. I said, no. He said, nurse, you're going with him. I said, no, I don't want anyone. I'm going in myself. I'm going in. I said, I love her, and I'm going in. I walked the door, opened the door, and there she lay, all covered up like this. And blank, the sheet pulled up over her face. I jerked the sheet down. My heart just a breaky. I put my hand on her, her perspiration on her forehead kind of felt sticky. I said, Hope, Hope, honey. I said, speak to me once. Well, just speak one time, won't you? I was shaking her. Friends, if I live a hundred years, I'll never forget what happened. Those two big brown eyes looked up at me. She was so weak, she couldn't say nothing. She was smiling. She took her finger and she motioned. And I got out and she said, well, oh, why did you call me, honey? And I said, well, they t <laughs> I said, I don't know. She said, oh, I, I was in another land. She said, it was so peaceful, I wasn't suffering. She said, great big birds like a great orient. And she said, there was a man dressed in white, one on each side, taking me to my home. Oh, friend, there, there's a land somewhere. I believe as she was dying, her eyes just opened up to see paradise beyond. She rallied for a little bit. The nurse come in and she said, nurse, come over. She said, I hope when you get married you have a husband like mine. And I said, oh honey, I haven't done that. She said, oh bless your heart. She pat me away. The nurse turned around and walked out crying. She said, Bill, I want to tell you a few things, but I'm going. So don't cry. And I said, all right. She said, don't let my babies be pulled about from pillar to post. She said, there's some things i got to confess to you. I said, what is it? She said, you remember one time that you were going a fishing, and, and I called you with that night we was going to Fort Wayne for a meeting? I said, yes. She said, you went and got me some stockings? I said, yes, I remembered it. She said, that was the wrong kind of stockings, honey. That wasn't right. But what it was, I, I'd been fishing. I uh, went up home, and we had to go to Fort Wayne. I was going to preach that night at Fort Wayne. Her father lived at Fort Wayne. So I was going up there to, to, to preach. And she, you know, there's two different kinds of a, a woman's socks that you buy. One's called, um, name them, somebody. Is it, is it Chiffon? Chiffon, that's right. And what's the other kind? Rhea? So is it Raymond or Raymond? Rhea? Which is the best? Chiffon. Well, they call 60 something cents then. And she was taking a bath and she said, Billy, you run down at the, at Penny's and get me some, some, uh, socks. And I said, all right. And I was going down the street and she said, and I remember, I didn't know about women's clothes. And she was saying, uh, against Chiffon. And I was going down the street saying, Chiffon, 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 Chiffon. Somebody said, hello, Brother Brandon. I said, hello, Chiffon, 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 Chiffon. And I met Orville Spawn down there and he, he said, Billy, Birch is biting over on the, about that. Oh, I said, my, I got talking to him and I forgot about what she said. Well, I, I was going to Penny's because I didn't know nobody there, but I used to have a little friend to come to my church the name of Thelma Ford. She worked in a 10 cent store, and I know they sold them over there, and I went over, and Thelma came up and said, What do you want, Billy? I said, I want some socks for Hope. I said, I hope don't wear socks. I said, She sure does. He said, She wears stockings. I said, That's right. That's right. And I thought, Oh, I've shown my ignorance already. And I said, She said, What kind do you want? And I said, What kind you got? <laughs> she said, I got. Chiffon and, and Ray, uh, what's it, Rayon's and cheap ones? She said, I got Rayon. And I said, that's what I want. That's what I want. She said, Hope won't Rayon. I all sound alike. Rayon, Chiffon. I didn't know the difference. She said, yes. And, she, and so she gave me, got them and put them in the sack. And I said, I want the full style. You know, that thing, got the little thing behind them, you know. That, I don't know. You know, I said, the full style. And, um, and um, so, oh, fashion, full fashion. That's what it was. And um, I said, that's the kind that I, I want. And she got them ready for me. She put them in the sack. It's only about 29 cents. And I said, well, give me two pair of them. And she said, are you sure that? I said, that's what she wanted. And so I went back. And I said, of course, you know how you men like to pop off to your women. And I said, looky here. I said, I'm Abraham's son. I'm a little Yiddish. You go to the river shopping. I'll buy two pair of stockings. Watch, you can buy one. Have money left. 
I said, this, I'm Abraham's son. I know how to do it. She said, you know, it's going on like that. God bless her heart. She's in her grave tonight and probably snow over it. And all we together there, I still think of her. That's right. And she gone on. And there, when she said, she was, and I thought it funny when she got to Fort Wayne, she wanted another pair of stockings. But she was lady enough not to say it. And she told me, she said, Billy, I give them to your mother. They was for an older woman than me. And I said, well, God bless you, honey. I didn't know that. I said, that was all right. She said, you remember that time you wanted to go hunting so bad and we was in Louisville and you seen that little twenty two rifle that you wanted and it cost $3 and something to pay down on it and you didn't have the money to pay on it? It's been about two years ago. And I said, yeah, I remember that. She said, Bill, I've always wanted to buy you that rifle. She said, I won't be with you but just a few minutes longer now. But she said, when you go home, look up on top of the old phone and bed under that paper. I've been saving nickels to buy the rifle. She said, Will you promise me you buy it? Oh, my. When I went home and found that $2 and something laying there, I'd like to kill me. I said, Sure. I said, Honey, you're not going on you. She said, I, I hate to leave you, but said, I must. She said, I don't mind it. She said, It's all right. So now another thing I'm going to ask you don't stay single. I said, Oh, oh, oh don't ask me. She said, Promise me. Promise me that you, that you won't stay single. My children have a home to go to and not be drug around everywhere. I said, honey, I, I can't do that. And she said, promise me. Well, she said, I, I can go a little easier. And she didn't mind it more than you mind taking a drink. She said, I I just said, I hate to leave you and the babies. But she said, oh, Bill, it's so wonderful to go like this. And I said, well, I'll do the best I can. And she said, another thing. She said, you realize why I'm going, don't you? Oh, that's what hurt. She said, if I wouldn't listen to Mama, I wouldn't listen to She said, it would have been different, wouldn't it? I said, that's right, honey. I said, oh, what will I ever do? She said, do this. Don't be ashamed of this Holy Ghost religion. She said, it's the greatest thing in the world to die by it. She said, stay and preach as long. And it said, promise me you'll go right out into the fields where we were supposed to go. And said, promise me that you'll do everything you can. She said, and tell everybody that it's glorious when you get ready to leave here. It's wonderful. And I said, oh, honey, it's so good to see you go like that. And she said, I, I said, where do you want me to place you? And she said, you take me up on the hill. I said, I'll take you out from over the ridge. And I'll, I'll bury you up there to heal your body. And I said, honey, I promise you I'm going, if God won't spare me, I'm going right out into the field and I'll never stop until the last drop of blood or life is gone from my body to do or try to make an atonement. And I said, I'll do everything that I can to live right. I'll do right. And I said, look. And she said, goodbye. And I said, are you going? I said, look. On that morning, I said, so we'll be able to get together now. I said, if, if on that morning, I want you to go to the east side of the gate. And I said, I want you to stand there. And when, it'll be terrible down here. I said, if, if I die before he comes, I'll be sleeping out there. I said, we'll get together. But if I'm somewhere on the field and be taken up, I said, you go there and wait for the children and stand there over the side of the gate. And then when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob coming in, start screaming, Bill, Bill, just as loud as you can. I said, I'll answer you there. She raised up her feeble hands. I kissed her goodbye. That was my last date with her. I'm on my road. That's right. Someday, someday, I shall go. When we took her down to the funeral parlor, I went home. I couldn't be satisfied nowhere. I went over to Mama's. I just, oh, I was crying. I went home. And they said, Mama said, stay over here. I said, no, I'm going home. We didn't have no friendship, but what it was was ours. And so I went home to lay down. And just then, Brother Frank Roy come up said, Billy, I hate to tell you something, son. I said, well, I was just right there. So said, that's not it. Your baby's dying, too. I said, can't be. He said, yes, it is. And away they took me out the hospital to see my uh, little Sharon, my little girl. I couldn't call her. I wanted to call her a Bible name. I called my little boy Billy Paul after me and after St. Paul. And then I wanted to call the baby a Bible name. I couldn't call her the Rose of Sharon, so I just called her Sharon Rose. And I went out to the hospital, and the doctor met me, and he said, Billy, she's dying, don't go in there. And I stood there at the legs, the nurse turned her back, and I run down there, and I went down to where she was at, I looked at her, and there's a little thing laying there, I never will forget, she's just eight months old. And I remember, I used to come home, uh, she'd sit out in the yard, and I'd blow my horn, like I'd come around the corner, and she'd go, goo, 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 just read, I just love those little fellows. And she was suffering so hard, for one of her little fat legs was moving up and down in a spasm, and looked like her little hand was waving. And I looked at her, and I said, Sherry, honey, you know Daddy? And I was trying to make myself strong. And I said, you know Daddy, honey? 
and her little lips got to quivering. And when she looked at me, she was suffering so hard that her little eye went crossed. Oh, my. When I seen that tender little blue baby eye cross, I didn't know it then. But I understand now, there's never been a cross-eyed child coming to line. But while I think of that, there's never been one passed over the platform, but what's been healed, too. I didn't know the crushing had to bring it forth. But I never think of it to see that. Now the lie crossing is she was suffering so hard. And I knelt down and I said, Oh, Jesus, please, God, I'm sorry for what I do. I said, Don't take her from me. I love her, Lord, with all my heart. Please, God. It looked like a big back curtain come falling down. I knew she was gone. I raised up, put my hand over on her head. I said, God bless you, my darling little sweet angel. I'm going to put you in the arms of Mother. The angel is coming to pack you home in a few minutes. But someday, Daddy will see you. I raised up my head and I said, God, you gave and you've taken away. I don't know why you're slaying me. I said, yet you may slay me. I'm going to trust you. Job did. I'm going to believe you. I said, somehow you're breaking my heart. I don't know how I'm going to hold up any longer, but I said, God, I commit her little soul to you. Take it, Lord Jesus. Put it on the altar with the mother, and someday let me come to see them. And as I did that, the angels of God sweetly come down and taken away her little breath and bore her away to be with her mother. I placed her in well, the mother, put them down beneath the ground, let us sit there. Brother Smith, the Methodist preacher, a friend of mine, he got some clods in his hand, walked over there, and I was standing there, he put his arm around me and said, Billy, brace up, honey boy. I said, oh, Brother Smith, my soul is good. I don't know what to do. And I heard him say, with that old clods dropping up on the little casket, he said, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, earth to earth. Oh, God, what can I do? Sound like the wind blowed down through the pine trees. It sounded like I heard a song saying, There's a land beyond the river that we call the sweet forever, and we only reached that shore by faith degree. One by one we gained the portal there to dwell with the immortal. Someday they'll ring the golden bell for you and me. I turned from the grave, brokenhearted, went home, I couldn't rest. Days passed. I could give up my wife, but that Oh, that baby, it was a choice in my heart. I didn't know what to do. Little sweet girl. And then I thought, oh, what will I do quickly now? One day, I went, I worked for the public service. I climbed up a pole early one morning to, to take off a pole meter. I was standing there and I was singing, On the hill, far away, stood an old rugged cross. I was good. I happened to look at the sun come up. Me hanging there on that pole working on these cross arms. Looked out on the side, and there looked like my figure a wiggling on that, looked like a cross out there. I thought, oh, Christ of God, yes, it was my sins nailed you there. I'm sorry for what I've done. Oh, I said, God, how could you ever put up with a person like me? You broke my heart. You ground me down, but what can I do? And I got real nervous. I had on a pair of rubber gloves. Then you line with those, test for 2300, running right by me around the primary. I thought, looky here, I can lay my hand on that primary, and in one minute's time, I'll be with Sharon. I jerked my glove off. I said, God, I've lost my mind or something. I said, Sherry, honey, I can't stand it no longer. Daddy's coming to be home with you. I said, look at them, 2,300 running there, break every bone in your body, electric. I said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the first thing you know, I was sitting down on the ground. I don't know. I believe if that gift had been foreordained, that would have been the end of your brother Branham right there. But God had something else to do. He had to grind that heart out and let him know, let me know that he's the one who rules and reigns. I went home. I couldn't stand it. Couldn't work. Went over to Mama. Mama said, honey, come in. Let me, let me make you quiet. I said, I'm going home. I went home. It was kind of cool weather. I took the mail out of the box and went around. I was trying to batch. We didn't have much in our house. I had an old cot sitting back there. But she'd lived there with me. We'd been together. That had been our, our home. And it, no matter how little it was, it belonged to her and I. Uh, it was us. A uh, whole thing would have been $3 for the furniture. But it belonged to her and I. It was worth as much as any of the good homes there is in the world. Because it was ours. And I went back there in the kitchen. Cold frost coming up through the floor. And I or never will forget. I opened up the mail. And the first mail I opened up, it said on there, Miss 
Sharon Rose Brandon. It was her little Christmas saving. The banker knew that she had never draw it. So Dollar Lady said, he sent it to me. Oh, I just couldn't stand it. I broke down and started crying. It was getting towards night. I knelt down on the floor. <laughs> I started crying and praying. And I, oh, what an hour. I couldn't hardly stand it. I went to sleep. Laying there, I dreamed. I thought I was out west. And when I was out west, I was walking down through the parade, and I was whistling that song. The wheel on the wagon is broken. Sign on the ranch for sale. I was whistling like that. I've seen an old prairie schooner, and the wheel broke down. And standing there by that schooner stood the most beautiful, blonde-headed girl, her pretty blue eyes shining, dressed in white. I had on a hat, and I passed by. I said, how do you do, miss? And put my hat back like that. And she said, hello, Dad. And I looked around, and I said, Dad? She said, sure. I said, well, young lady, I beg your pardon. I said, uh, you're as old as I am. How could I be your daddy? She said, Daddy, don't you know me? And I said, no, ma'am, I'm afraid I don't. She said, you just don't know where you are, Daddy. And I said, well, uh, what do you mean? She said, where's Billy Paul? That's your little brother. And I said, uh, what is it? She said, Daddy, on earth, I was your little Sharon. I said, Sharon? My baby? She said, yes, Daddy. I said, remember, we're immortal here. When we come here, we're not little babies no more. We're all one age. And I said, oh, honey, are you Sharon? She said, I said, where's Mother? I said, she's up at your, the new home. I said, a home? I said, yeah. I said, well, honey, there's something wrong here. I said, Branham's never had homes. We're more like the vagabond people. I said, uh, we, uh, we don't have no home. She said, but, Daddy, you got one up here. I looked around over to my right, and that was a great, big, beautiful home, and there was lights shining up all around. She said, Mother's waiting for you. I'm going to wait here for Billy. I said, all right, honey. I took out running as hard as I could, my hat in my hand. I run right up to the step. When I got there, Hope would usually meet me, come out with her arms out. And I went up and run up the steps as hard as I could. Now I got up top of the step. Here she come, dressed in white, that black hair hanging down. She comes right up to me. She raised out her arm. I run to her, throw my hat down, just knelt down on the side of her. She put her hand on my head. She said, Bill, what are you worried about, honey? I said, oh, I can't stand it any longer. I said, I see, is that Sharon Rose down there? She said, yes, Bill. She said, what are you worrying about? You're worrying about me and Sharon? And I said, honey, I, I just can't stand it. I, she said, stop worrying. I said, don't worry. We're lots better off than you are. And I said, that may be so, but I said, oh, didn't she make a pretty woman? Aren't we proud of her? She said, sure. She said, aren't you tired? And I said, honey, I've just been preaching and praying for the sick so long. And that's the way I know I'll go. It had to come. It hadn't come yet. I said, I've just been preaching and praying for the sick to him so tired. I can't hardly stand up. She said, won't you sit down? And I looked, and there was a great big Morris chair sitting there. I looked at her, and she looked back at me. She said, I know what you're thinking. Down here one time, I, we had them three old chairs or two old chairs at the house. And 